Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual event today. I'm Paula Lance. I'm the James B. Hudak Professor of Health Policy and the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Ford School of Public Policy. And it is my great honor and pleasure today to be hosting a conversation with the amazing coach, John Beeline. Welcome, Coach. Thank you. Thanks, Paula, very much. This is this is great to be back sort of in the classroom again right now uh, with a lot of people, a lot smarter than me, but maybe we got I got some things we can share. Well, I think we're going to have a really fun conversation today. So we're so glad you're here with us. Uh, I, I know Coach Beeline does not need any kind of introduction for many people, but let me just do a, a little bit of introduction before we get going here. John Beeline was the head coach of the University of Michigan's uh, men's basketball program from 2007 to 2019. And during this time, he led a golden era in the men's basketball program, appearing in two national title games and making it to the NCAA tournament nine times out of his 12 seasons at the University of Michigan. He is the winningest coach in the history of the University of Michigan men's basketball program, and he is beloved in the University of Michigan community. And it's not just for his coaching ability and record, but he's also greatly admired because of his positive spirit and his winning approach to team development and leadership. So again, thank you, Coach, for sharing your time with us today to talk about leadership and how lessons from elite competitive athletics are relevant to leadership and team building in other arenas, including the arena of public service, which we care so much about at the Ford School. Okay, so, thanks. Thank you. Great. So I, I have some questions I'm going to ask Coach Beeline. Uh, and we also have received a number of questions already from uh, people in the audience. And so I'll be weaving those into my conversation with him. We hope we have time for some more questions from the audience. So um, those of you joining us right now, please submit your questions either uh, via the chat function or you also can tweet your questions uh, via um, Twitter using the hashtag policy talks. All right, coach, you ready to get going? I am ready. Let's All right. go. Let's go. All right. Question number one. Um, a little bit of background. So here at the Ford School, our core mission is really making, making a difference. And we're a community dedicated to the public good. And our definition of leadership here at the Ford School is really simple. We define leadership as the intentional behavioral process of having a positive impact on others, on organizations and communities. So leadership to us is just really having an intentional positive impact on others, organizations and communities. What's your working definition of leadership? How do you define it? How do you see it? And also why is leadership such an important component of um, athletic programs and also really specifically related to team building and team performance? Yeah, I think I think we're, we're on the same page with the, the definition. I, uh, I have it sort of that uh, defined just slightly different, that uh, leadership is the practice of educating, inspiring, influencing, and motivating others to be their best selves. And, and let me break those four things down to you. One of the things that we've learned as we build a culture of and, and teaching, lead, teaching our players to be leaders, to assistant coaches, is there's an education component to it. I think you have to understand leadership is we're not just born leaders and as some may be, but most people, most people, I have to learn about it. And that's why I have a passion for teaching. Now I'm teaching it over in the school of education. And uh, it's, it's important that you educate this. We found that people aren't going to learn to lead through osmosis. You, you have to actually give them some of the steps that you have to take. Uh, I think that inspiring them is, is huge. And I think, that, ha that has an awful lot to do you know, with how you build relationships in leading. You can't inspire any, anyone if you don't have a good relationship with them or really a positive one that you, you know them, you have empathy for them. You, you, we say, you know, the player is inside the person. You know, you don't get the player unless you get the person. And that's so important. And then uh, next is, is just influencing I think old leaders and still some leaders today, they think they influence through power. 
Or I'm going to lead you because why? Because because I said that's why. That's because I'm the leader, and that's not the way you're going to lead. You have to in, really choose power over influence, or choose influence over power all the time. It's really my, General Martin Dempsey told me that when I was with the Cavaliers last year. He, he's a tremendous uh, hero, uh, 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 Army general, and uh, talked to me about that uh, as I was trying a different method of leadership. And then finally, right in motivating there, that's so important that you said a positive. You know, this tone at the top that Dave Brandon used to talk about with me, our ex-athletic director, is this positive sort of, I'm there, I'm there every day. It's it's like Michigan's defense right now. It 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 every day they're coming to play defense. They may have a bad day now and then in de- in offense, but their defense is there. If you come every day with this positive attitude, you know, it's people will go your way. Uh they, they will follow you if they feel it's uh the uh, the it's amazing. It's a it's a heliotropic effect that people go towards sunshine. They're going to go that way every say whenever they can. Kim Cameron is a great teacher at Michigan over in the business school, and he's taught me a lot about this heliotropic effect. So that's my that's my that's my long winded one of leadership, but it's got four pretty good components to it. Yeah, I really I like that, um, and I want to. Um, riff off of that a, a little bit and go a little deeper into, into this. Um, what are, what are some lessons about team building and leadership from athletic teams that you think are important for other groups of people who work together professionally yeah. or even people in communities who are trying to get together to ha- make some kind of positive change within their community? And what are the behaviors and skills that are important for leaders across the board? You know, we spend yeah, teaching this course, as I said, and we take we spend the, the first couple of weeks about self-awareness. In order to be a good leader, you have to really know who you are. I mean, one year I tried to I tried to lead. I was reading a book uh, about about Bobby Knight, this great coach from Indiana and one of the best ever three national championships and, and probably tried to coach more like him. And that's not my personality. I'm not saying one's better or the other. But you have to find out who you have. Build your own core values. Decide just right now what's really important to you. That's how we came to our core values at Michigan. We huddled up with my staff. I had a new staff, and they said, "Coach, uh, what we got? We got to put this down. We got to teach this. We 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 cannot just wait for it to happen. What's really important to you? And then we'll work with the team, see what's really important to them, and try and mesh these things." And that's that's where it starts. That self awareness that you you have, and then a- after that, to be this good leader, right? You gotta you gotta stay true to those values as you go through. If that's what you believe in, you gotta go there. A certain flexibility, versatility is huge, but you have to be true to that and stay there. I call and then I call it the vet, and I learned this from. Uh, I, I'm not I don't like throwing names around, but I don't like to take credit for something I didn't think of. But uh, I was fortunate last year to go down and see the St. Louis Cardinals in spring training. And I wanted to talk with their GM about uh, leadership, John Mozalek. And he, he mentioned three things that were really important to today's leadership. And I call it now the vet. I teach it to my class. Being vulnerable. V, be vulnerable. You don't know it all. People won't follow you if you will not, you will not admit your mistakes. And I, I, I think if you look at this past year, with this pandemic, if we had addressed it maybe differently, if we, if several people would say, we goofed, let's do this, let's do that. What, what could have happened in that? Or, you know, the political parties now fight with each other. How about my bad? Just, I was wrong. You were right. Admit it. And what a, what a good thing. And then empathy. I think today's world, it, it, it's so important that we have that for each other. I think we've seen that in all different ways of inclusion right now, of of people reaching out, social justice. Empathy is so important. And then as we're all in the Twitter world and the email world and the Instagram world, if you aren't transparent, people are going to find out the other way. And you don't, that's, you'd rather be out front and be transparent and say, invulnerability, I goofed, or we're going to do this because this is what the big data says, not because I said so. Those, those things we are huge. And then the last thing in being this leader is you got to be a listener. I, I finally went to this point where never having assistant coaches early in my 
career, I thought I had to do it all. And when I started listening to more and reaching out uh, and, and asking questions, I found out I certainly didn't know it all. And let's bring in people who know differently than me. And let's let's blend together and or incorporate that, including with your team. Listen to your team. And, and there may be some values you're not, you know, if they all will say, say to you, all right, we really want to be late for practice every day. There's some non-negotiables you're not going to do. But they're going to say, hey, coach, you know, I used to make the guys really dress up for dinner. And, and, they, and, and then after a few years, I just end up saying, and I don't even know if it was in Michigan. I think it was at West Virginia. They said, Coach, we really have to dress up for dinner. It's just a pregame meal. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. I, we don't have to do You know, you just give in to these different areas. Or, Coach, we're practicing too early on a Saturday. Could we move it back? Those are those little things that are so important that you, you listen to them because uh, then you give them ownership. When you listen to them, you give them ownership. And our best teams – our best teams, the championship teams, are the ones that went all the way to national championship. We were on cruise control in March. I mean, we, the coaches and I, put together a few things. The Mo Wagner's, the Trey Burks, the Tim Hardaway's, Duncan Robinson. They were running those teams at the end. Nick Stauskas and Glenn Robinson. That was their team. Coach, we got it. We got it. And that's where I think you want to get to. That's great. And that um, that's great segue into the, the next question. Um, and you, you had mentioned this before that leadership is not about power. Um, and here at the Ford School, we talk a lot about how t- being a leader doesn't mean you're the boss of everything or that you have control of all, all of the resources. And every team needs everyone to show up with their leadership skills. But I, an audience member did pose, a, I think, what is a fair question, and that is, does a team have to have one clear leader? Um, you might have a, a lot of leaders on your team, but should there be someone who is more sort of a point person in a leadership position on a team? Or can you just have a team no, I, where I, everyone's I, the leader? Well, I, I do think there's there's got to be somebody, maybe a name, you know, to be able to do that. But they they don't have to be the leader. I mean, they could be the coach, but I mean, there's teams that in the NBA and things like that, that when it came to decision time, they would look to the captain and say, what do you want to do? And so, uh, but I, I think that the more leaders, the better. I mean, really, the more leaders, the better. We studied leadership. We went down to see Lieutenant Colonel Mike Irwin at West Point because, I mean, they're teaching to, to, the, to the West Point cadets. That they're teaching leadership every single day. And truth is, not everyone becomes a general. So they're not, they don't all become this ultimate leaders, but they can lead in different ways. You know, somebody decides for them to charge, but somebody's got to lead them out of there and somebody's got to have the rear flank while they're charging. So there's all different elements to leadership. And and our teams, many times our non-scholarship guys were our best leaders uh, because they brought it every day with no agendas. And that example was really leadership to the great players. Austin Hatch brought us leadership every day without saying a word. When he came in every day for practice, a great player could not play anymore, but was just his visualization was showed leadership in some ways. But I don't think you can have too many leaders unless they are, they're like this and they're not willing to have empathy for each other, walk in each other's shoes. Mm -hmm. So here, here's another question from an audience member. Uh, and you spoke before about um, the, the core values that you had that were motivating. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what were those core values, but also what were the methods you used to get your players to buy into the core values and the team culture you were trying to create? And how do you think that impacted performance? Well, we, we as I said, when we went on this, this mission, and, and we actually wrote up a, Michigan, uh, a mission statement. And then we went to our core values and it came out to be as an acronym, you paid unity that we were going to be the team, the team, the team. You know, we listen to Bo Schembechler's speech every year to start our season. Uh, passion. We wanted people that, that we were looking for and recruiting on the team, everything. They love Michigan. They love basketball and they love their teammates. Appreciation. We always wanted this attitude of gratitude. For everything we did, we're blessed to be able to play at this university. We're blessed to have the skills to play at a high level, uh, to have a scholarship for some of them, right? Integrity, the absolute most important one. I would have had it first, but I should have, I, I guess I could go to I paid, 
you know, but I, I wouldn't know what to do with the you then. So it is, it's really integrity. You can have all this stuff. You can have passion, unity. You can, you lie, cheat, steal, you shortcut, you not, don't have integrity. You lose it all. You lose it all. And then diligence was the last one that we were going to work. And everybody thinks all the time, well, I'm going to work really hard. That's going to put me ahead. Yes. Because if you don't work, you won't get ahead. But everybody else is working hard too. So you have to understand that, that other teams, other companies, they're working hard too. You're the only ones that invent hard work. And that's why you have to be efficient with it and know that you will not survive without it. You might get some breaks. You might, you might do the right thing here or there. But so how did we teach it is we taught it that we would go in in the first day of, of uh, practice or video or something. We was unity. And we would give the definition of unity. We would look at every word in it. We would talk, we'd give different examples of unity. Uh, go to when we'd have different uh, speakers come in. All right, tell me about a team in the past that you've had that was very unified and how did they do? And then tell me about a team that wasn't and how did they do? Just giving them those ideas. Because you know what? Many times, and I don't mean this in a bad way, mom and dad, right? Brothers and sisters, your friends back home, they don't care if you win. They want to know how many points and rebounds you have. And it's absolutely conflicting. And you got to get to that point. So we taught all those things every day and brought people in, also speakers, to do it as well. And pretty soon, there's not one of our, you know, there's a lot of people that have core values. They can't remember them. There's not one of our guys, I'm confident, doesn't know what you paid uh, stands for. And it's probably applying it in every aspect of their life. Exactly. After college. We added accountability in year five or six because we had lost a lot of people and we be from to the NBA. And we had a bunch of young people and they were still learning how important that was to hold themselves accountable and each other. Uh, Brian Townsend says something. What is, is the, uh, it's a, it's a T that, Oh, shoot, I'm forgetting. Now, Brian Townsend teaches uh, leadership over in the athletic department. The weight of honesty. Your team can bear the weight of honesty. Just think about that, that you can tell the truth and people can take it. And and that's so important that people don't want to hold each other accountable because they're, fr they're afraid whether that, you know, that people can bear that weight of honesty. That's great. I love that. All right, so next question. Um, what is your advice for teams in regard to understanding and working through differences they might have, and especially differences that arise from people coming together from really different backgrounds, cultures, identities, and life experiences? You know, what can individuals and then teams do to get past conflicts and tensions that arise? Yep. We ended up every year, uh, Paul, bringing Brian Townsend over from the from the leadership department and the athletic department, and we we had everybody by themselves at their own tables put down their values. What is your? What's the three things most important to you? And very rarely were they the same. And and then we put them up in a spectrum going across. And there would be somebody I love and I would coach to the end of the earth. And I did it too. And I would say, he's at the other end of the spectrum than me. He values different things. When, when I became a, uh, when I became a father and particularly Andy, my son may be watching right now, the, the fourth of my four children. When, when I found Andy, when I got to know Andy better, you got, you know, he's not a baby anymore, but I'm just watching him move around. I, I said, I'm four for four. All four of my children are very different. And so when I became a better coach immediately that Shauna, Patrick, Mark, and Andy, that they're all so different that how could I ever expect my team to all be the same? When with the same mom and same dad, they these were all so different. So we, we would teach the values. And I'd say at the other end of that spectrum is, for example, John Teske. And I'm way over here. And we are very aligned, but we think differently. And once you understand that different people have different values and you respect them, you just get there. You just, you, you there's so much respect because they'll do it to you. They'll do it to you. And you don't know what, you don't know how they were raised or what 
challenges they had, or maybe they had no challenges too. And if you realize that, then you understand maybe that's why they're having trouble with this challenge. Or if you, you, you know, the whole thing is try and find out why they are the way they are by just getting to know them. And that's, it's very, very simple. So we really put a lot of time into that and have coaches go on and just Greg Harden from the university would come in and talk with every player. And I remember we had one player I won't mention, but he really broke down in front of the team to say about a relationship he had that had really been difficult for him his whole life. And now the team knew all the time. They know all they knew from the rest of the time what he had gone through and look at him differently. So again, walking and uh, walking uh, steps in someone else's shoes is really important. Even as Joe Biden said for a moment, Joe Biden's mother for a moment, right? Said for a moment, just walk in their shoes. And I think we need to do that for a moment, no matter what political party you are and what type of leadership you're in. Were there things you looked in, uh, looked for in potential recruits related no, I, to, to these leadership things we're t- talking about and how could you see them or how did you try to get things revealed yeah. as you were trying to build um, and recruit? Yeah, you know, it, it was the, uh, and you can't, you couldn't do it now. So I probably wouldn't have done very well recruiting right now, but we used to make everyone, you know, a lot of people offer scholarships and they haven't even met the guy yet. We intentionally made everybody had to come to campus to meet us to get a scholarship offered. And even we didn't might not even see them play yet. And we and but we get that out of the way. Once you come to camp, we get to know you. We didn't care who we didn't get, Paula. We cared who who we got. I, I, I told the group today at 12, 35 games in a season, you don't do your due diligence and you get the wrong guys on your team, right? They will, they could beat you 35 times. Your own guys could beat you. He goes somewhere else because you're unsure. He might beat you once or twice. So we don't want people that just don't 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 get that and or to come from have that same values. Now, with all that being said, we have kids that came from the dirt, dirt poor situations and just barely because of a lack of opportunity in their grade school and junior high and high school, they had they had the ability but they didn't have the resources to actualize their potential. And then we had other ones that were the valedictorian of their class and every guy graduated because we, we made sure we saw that they got it. Michigan, they understood Michigan was going to be academics first. Yeah, you can go to the pros, but unpack your bags for four years. And if you, if you go to the pros, fine. But if not, you're, you're going to study all you're doing, you're, you're doing everything just like everybody else, embrace this experience. So I think that's it, getting, getting to understand each other and knowing that we're all different. Uh, and, and the world has come so much farther. It's, we're not there yet, maybe not even close. But I just look, look back 23 years with inclusion in all areas, and we're moving in the right direction, just not fast enough. Thank you. So I, I think some uh, Ford School students and some of my colleagues at the Ford School might be surprised to learn that I was actually a competitive athlete back in the day. My sport was gymnastics. Uh, and gymnastics is a very different sport than basketball, for sure. Um, uh, I know basketball is hard, but I'm going to say, um, try thinking a moment about um, performing feats of strength and flexibility and precision and grace on a four-foot piece of wood elevated off the floor. That's uh, it's, a, it's a very different sport. Yeah. But, um, you know, th- th- what I really want to get to is that gymnastics is a really different sport from a lot of other sports because it's a team sport. You're competing as a team, but you're also competing as an individual against your own teammates, which is it's hard. There was always a tension in that for me, competing yep. as the team and then also trying to beat my teammates as well. Um, and I think on any team there, we can't deny there is some competitive tension yeah, yeah. on teams who are trying to achieve the, the same goal. So how did you how did you coach your team members um, around this tension regarding individual performance yeah. versus team performance? And, and with with the money that's available in the NBA and the pressure from home or anywhere, you know, when after a game, you know, I mean, we, we were fortunate enough to have a, an awful lot of NBA first rounders and second rounders 
And everybody sort of saw that, but everybody else wants to do that too. And they think maybe it is uh, the, their best way to get there is to focus on themselves. And really the best way to get there is focus on your team. I, I can't tell you, I watched Tim Hardaway. The only pressure on him was he wanted to be the best player he could be. And it, it, and winning was so important to him over his own self. And his first two years didn't even look at the NBA because his dad had lived it. He wanted to just be good. And his junior year, we had to say, you know, you're a first rounder. What do you want to do? And while he wasn't completely surprised, it wasn't like all he dreamed about. I got to get to the NBA. I got to do that. Where some that that really gets in the way that the high we say the high tide rises every boat. We all know that the high tide rises every boat. And so if I, I contend that we've had so many guys draft in the NBA because we were playing in late March when all of the world is watching college basketball. And so if we don't win, nobody knows about you. And we, so we preach that. I think regarding gymnastic, I, I heard this, one of our speakers at my class brought this up and it was really uh, apparently the Norwegian cross country rifle team. I believe it is. So they cross country ski, shoot a rifle, and then they go and they're competing against other countries, but their own team. And apparently what they would do is some of their best ones would go out front first and then call back to their teammates what the challenges were. The conditions, really yeah. Giving them a chance to do better than they were. And what's happened is they've become the elite ski team because they all have gotten better through it. And they cha they changed the leaders and different things like this. And it's so it, people have to understand that, 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 and if you, if you, you know, look at this thing that I'm okay, you're okay. We both can do this. Iron sharpens iron, the competition, you know, th there's so much to that of the competition of just being at your best every day or somebody else going to take my spot here, right. In this, uh, on this team, it's healthy. There's that, that area where you don't want it too easy and you don't want it too hard, but there's that that bell curve at the top that is really good where you have pressure and you have demand. That's where you get the best out of everybody. Excellent. All right, got a question from, uh, from the audience. Someone uh, writes, I often find it hard to judge myself as a leader. Things are not always easily observable or measurable. So how do you recommend that people evaluate themselves as leaders? And do you want to share how, you know, you've, you've done that over the years. How have you assessed yourself and your leadership? Well, I think that you, first of all, there, there's probably a million books on leadership out there. I will not be writing one, but it, it is really, uh, it's, it's really important that, you know, there's resources out there to learn about this. I think, again, Write down what's really important. What are your values? What are your core values that are really important to you? And they may be just, you know, uh, with you. They, that, that may exclusively to you. But then you may not be comfortable going out there with all those things. We, we, we say all the time, you know, just pivot every now and then. Just pivot and move yourself a little bit into that arena where you can speak up and say something or do something that has leadership to get you comfortable being a leader. And all of a sudden, like Trey Burke, John Teske, very rarely said much. But every now and then they would say something in practice or in a game that everybody listened to when they did their little pivot. Scott Novak, or yeah, Novak, or Novak, you never had to say anything about him, right? Zach, I'm sorry, Zach Novak. I get him mixed up with a guy named Scott Unger, who was another great leader for me at Richmond. But Zach Novak was the ultimate leader. I mean, he was given orders or given leading coming out of the womb. But the uh, other guys just had to pivot at that time. Uh, and so it, it is really a uh, it, it's it comes down to yourself right now, getting to know yourself and then being comfortable right with what you want to lead in. And it, like it could be I when we ask our our, our classes. You know, some some people say, I want to lead in empathy. That's my, my thing. But then, you know, just do it and it will sort of happen to you. Show you do that every single day. You know, make a list. 
this, the, the, make a list of things you're going to do that are going to be empathetic that day and do them. They, both Scott Unger and Zach Novak will laugh now because I called Zach Scott many, many times. <laughs> they were the, they were both left-handed, both playing out of possession, both bright as can be, and both great leaders. So I'm uh, sorry about that, guys. I mixed your name. <laughs> what do you what do you think about um, you know, the 360 evaluations are pretty, they've been around for a while and, and pretty common. Um, you know, what do you think about that? Like, you know, everyone asking everyone else they work with, how am I doing? Yeah. Uh, let's all take a look at each other and see, you know, how everyone's doing individually, but then also how we're doing as a, a team. Yeah, it is. Um... Can I say I love it and I want people to do it? No, but I, we did do we did virtually do it one time with me. Very uncomfortable, <laughs> and but what also happened out of it was there were some clear misunderstandings that I had not communicated well, but our intentions were the same, and it was just the simplest mistake that we could correct. And at the same time, I also heard you know things that. Uh, that probably were, I, I thought I was doing a good job. You, there's a book, Leadership and Self-Deception, which my class is reading right now. I just finished reading. And it, it's, it's exactly about that. You think you're leading sometimes and you're not. You're not. And you got, you're really betraying yourself when, when you do not uh, look at yourself truthfully and try to, to get on the other side of that. And it basically comes down, are you treating everyone, are you treating everyone as a real person? Or are you treating everyone, that's the janitor, you know, uh, that's my wife, you know, that is the teacher, that is my classmate, or is that John, this very unique man with has a family, does everything, and he happens to be sweeping the floors. And it's a different thing. And as a result, I think that's that's so important that we get to that point with everybody um, when we when, when as we're looking to lead. Thank you. So last week when we met and uh, we're having our pre-session for this, we discovered that we both have a mutual appreciation for uh, the same person who you actually mentioned already, and also a book. So University of Michigan yeah. uh, alumnus Michael Irwin uh, has a book called Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit uh, about this book and, and Dr. Irwin's main message in the book about the really important role of solitude and reflection yeah. in leadership. He's not quite a doctor yet, but he'll work on it. Okay, that's right. That's right. He's a lieutenant colonel. And uh, but he is a major started person. a PhD. He was in a PhD program in psychology at the University of Michigan. That's right. Yeah. So he is he is a uh, he's an amazing man who has studied this for a long time and and just uh, some of the best leaders. You you just need this time, especially today, to have solitude, to think. And if you think about it, meditation is the best. I mean, it's the best. I've used it now for 20 years. Uh, prayer is a similar vehicle. Exercise is a similar vehicle where you shut everything down and you just think. And it's so it's so important that we turn off the noise and just get away from it. You just the the time right now, the focusing times. I think Mike, I, I, I'm not. These are approximate numbers, but let's say. People used to stay focused for 30 seconds. Their attention span was 30 seconds 10 years ago. Well, now it's 15 seconds. We actually did this with our huddles. When Mike told us, we tried to break up our huddles to make sure that we did not go too long in a huddle on one subject and change things around with a different people talk, different person talking. But you're dealing with a, with a uh, I forget the numbers, but it's an unbelievable number of times that a high schooler a college student, a grade school looks at his phone in a day and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that, and they, and they did the studies too about, you know, if you put a, put a phone next to you and take a test, you put a phone in your bag and take a test and you put your phone in the next room and take a test and consistently data was you do the best when the phone's in the other room. So those things are so important that you shut out so you can think clearly. 
I mean, you, you have to be able to do this. And it was so important for me that meditating before every game, I had a positive a one that I did that I always saw us winning the game. I always saw our team, me shaking the hands of the team we beat. I could smell the hot dogs. I could, I did everything to, to do that so that when I'd get into a huddle, I'd been there before. And it's, it's the power of it. LeBron James uses it so much. I'm sure the golfers use that like crazy. I mean, I need to start doing it with golf. So it is, it's, it's like this power that we all have. You got to try and make that your competitive advantage. You, you have to make it your competitive advantage. And, and uh, the, all the resources we have in that phone, they're tremendous. But they, it's like me running too many plays. If we ran, and I probably did run too many plays. But if we ran 100 plays lousy instead of 10 plays really good, right? We would not, we would not have had the success that we had. So the, you're, we're running plays every day and you got to cut it down so that you do what's most important. Yeah. The, the, everything you're saying is so important. Uh, I, I want to focus the, this part of our conversation more on Ford school and, and Ford school students and you know even the, all, all of us here at the Ford School I mean we've just come through an incredibly contentious election year and election cycle and the aftermath from that and you know to be in the in the field of public policy and public affairs is to be up on the news and you know yeah. every bit of news and what's happening not only in the United States but but globally, and you sometimes feel like if you, you know, don't look at your phone for two hours, you're way behind in the in the in the very fast paced news cycle. So uh, I know I'm guilty of it. You know, I have my phone by my bed, and if I wake up and which I do every night, I wake up in the middle of the night and I check the COVID numbers and stuff. It's it's bad, right? <laughs> but I think it, part of it is it come. It's it's better to have all this information at our fingertips, but it's too it's too easy. So. Yeah, actually, can you give me some advice and then get all the four, you know, the people who are, you know, sort of in our world where, again, being up on the news and every political take on the news is what we do and we have to do to, to do our work in the world. Well, it's the same, same thing with me. I'm checking box scores in the middle of the night, see how my NBA guys are doing or how different teams in the Big Ten are doing. And you know, people forget that we all turned out all right when we waited for the Sunday, the paper to come in the next morning to read the news. And not very, uh, the, what you have to do, anything that's really important, you're probably going to get a phone call on. If you don't respond, you're going to get, if it's really, you can't miss it, you're going to get a phone call on. And the next day you, you can take care of it. But I'm guilty of it. I'm really guilty of it. I, I have a lot of things going on and we would talk with our team about it and uh, but it's something that you have to, we have to address because it's not going to get better. You know, one suggestion Mike had, take all your uh, notifications off your phone. Just eliminate them. Don't get any notifications because how many of them are really important? But how all many of them <laughs> are going to distract you so much yeah. and take you away from what's really, really important. And uh, you, you just cannot, you, you can't go there. And But uh, th the other thing, again, is that your brain is scrambled. It is scrambled. You're not using the parts of the, the brain that allow you to be successful. You're, it's just cluttered in a mess. And um, I, uh, I, I, I think I do a pretty good job with it now. And I've always done a pretty good job with it. But I think we're in danger with the younger generation that's grown up with it, that this is, this is huge, that they understand this and manage it. You can't eliminate it, but just manage it better. And make it make it one of your goals. I'm not I, like right now. I'm trying to find a time that I just do email at this time. I'm not going to do any emails during the day, but I'm going to do it from five to six at night or seven to eight in the morning. That's it. I'm not going to look at it again. And uh, and then I've gone where I'm not looking at the sports scores till tomorrow morning. I'm just not going to do it. You know, believe it or not, you, you youngins, you, if the team played on the West Coast back when I was growing up, we had to wait for the evening news to get the scores the next day. You had to go out to the mailbox and get the evening news, and then you'd find out how the Cardinals and the Dodgers did in a game because it wasn't on – or everybody stayed up to 11 o'clock to get the news 11 o'clock every night on three channels. 
So we all got through that all right. Our generation turned out all right. We don't need all of this. All right. Well, how about we make a deal? I'll hold you to not looking at the sports scores all the time. And then I'll try not to look at the, the daily new COVID numbers every day. All right. All right. I'm, I'm looking at some questions that have come in from, from audience members. So let me peek at that. Um, so someone from the Ford school um, posted this question. Often teams will have two members who clash in some way. Can be a, it can be just a personality clash. It could be a clash around values that you talked about before. As a leader, how do you help people on a team resolve those differences? And then what do you, what do, you do if you can't fix it? I think the best way that we've always done this and We've had these issues before. We, when you have two, two or three guys all uh, trying to have the same have the same goals, make it to the NBA. There, there's going to be these these times where somebody shoots when somebody else is open, et cetera. The best way that we've been able to handle it was let's all get in the room together. With you know, always have, as a leader, always have somebody else in the room with you that is another leader. Do not ever meet with anybody individually. Uh, because you want to make sure that everybody repeats what was said in there and there's somebody else to hear it. But we, I take an assistant coach and, uh, you know, one time we had four players that all, uh, had to taken the same amount of shots over like 20 games. I mean, they were within one shot per game of each other, but all of them were wondering, didn't think they were getting enough shots. So we had say to them, all right, so what do you want us to do? Once so-and-so gets to eight shots, he can't shoot anymore because they're leaving him open, but but you got to get your shots too. I mean, you just be real with them. And I think when you get, when you you take two people like that and you put them in a room with an assistant coach or not or a co-manager or something, and just say, This is our observations. How can we assist you? Uh, what are the differences? You are too, be positive. You are too amazing. Uh, talents, and we want to get the best out of both of you. But I, I don't see that happening right now because of some friction. How can we eliminate that? Because that's one thing, that's one value. Uh, we cannot coexist that way. And that's where you got to be real with them. You, you got to tell them this, you guys can get this done, or I'm going to have to get it done, but let's talk it out. And maybe I can advise you. A anytime there are so many times that you have to tell the truth. Just just tell the truth. And I'm not saying people lie. I'm just saying tell them the truth and show them data. It's always good to have big data, too, to show them not, oh, this is one game or this was one event. Show them over a year. Keep a log. That's what all these. I always keep a log on everything that's going on for your own protection, but more to say, OK, they'll say, oh, you know what, you uh you know, last night you did, you didn't, uh, you, I didn't like the way you were in the locker room and you said some things and then, oh, well, it's only once coach. I said, no, let's go back to last year and then be this year. And then this, these things are really important as a leader. You don't want to do it, but that's no, no leader ever usually complains on payday. There's extra responsibilities to being a payday, uh, to being a leader. There's extra responsibilities and you can't say, ah, they'll figure it out or damn them. They're, they're, they're not good teammates. No, you're the leader. You got to figure out a way to do this. And it usually works out, but not if you hide from it or you pull one in and talk to them, then pull the other one in. And nobody knows that you talk to each other and you're trying to slip it in the side door. No, just face it right in front of you in a positive way. Did you ever have the experience that you couldn't work it out between yeah. two people? Uh, it was more the the person and the team. The person and the team. And finally, at some point, we had to let people go. We just had to say, "Listen, this is uh, good luck, and uh, you're you're still on scholarship, but we have to move on. We have to move on. So uh, it's just best for you, and it's best for the team. And it's it's hard, but I think uh, virtually every place that I've been, that has happened at least once." In virtually every place that we've been, uh, there's been success, you know, following that because and su maybe success for them, too. 
more success with them. But certainly for us, every time, uh, so, you know, addition by subtraction, you don't want it. But if people have their values are that different and they're not willing to see eye to eye, then you got to and maybe two people have to go if both of if it continues to go. But usually what the one that you see is is the uh, most detrimental to it. You know, you have to make a decision. Hard decision. It's hard, hard decision. All right. Another question from the audience. When you are the leader of a team for a long time, how do you maintain engagement of that team? And what strategies do you use to continually be effective? Yeah, that is a good question because, you know, I didn't have to do that until I was at Michigan. I was every year I'd been every place I'd been except Lemoyne was five years, five years, fix it, five years, move on, fix the program, move, move in another direction. Then after being at Michigan for the first five, I realized I had to continue to evolve. I had to do self and analyst to see uh, to see who I was, right, and, and understand was I in touch with the team. Uh, it's so important that they understand. I, I said this this morning that that you have to stay, continue to relate with your team members and try to stay up with what's important to them. And as you're with somebody a long time, you're going to get older. They might get younger and you have to, you have to show you can relate with them. Number one, you can have to show that you care about them off the court, off the field, out, out of the business room. Number two, right. That, that you end up have to show them, you know, your stuff. So all of a sudden you've been in this, that uh, you've been coaching or you've been leading, but you're not ready to go in the digital age because they are, you're uncomfortable with it and you're still trying to lead you're not going to be able to lead anymore. So do you know your stuff? And then can you benefit them? Can you make them better? That's one that uh, we brought in. Uh, I brought in a woman from Cal to coach our, uh, uh, to coach at the Cavaliers, the, one of the first women to be on the bench. Uh, there's several now, but she, not the first, but few. And uh, that's how she coached those three things. And I talk to everybody about that now, those four values there. But the biggest thing is relate with them. Uh, that you know that you can relate with them and yet you care about them off the court. So that's that's basically, you know, how you get to that point um, in leadership. So that the example you just gave makes me, I really, I really want to ask you, were there any gender issues with bringing in um, a woman to coach at the professional basketball level? And I, I know that it's not the first time this has happened, but I, you know, in my work, um, uh, I think a lot about gender issues and other kinds of uh, identity issues on on teams. So I'm just wondering if you have any uh, had that experience and other experiences, how gender. Lindsay, getting Lindsay a locker room was the hardest thing in the NBA, that she could have her own locker room. And so we built her one and she was the only one, but we built her own locker room. And there was just these things that we had to do. But she she brought a perspective that was very unique and and we we really uh she's she's gonna she's gonna be as long as she wants to stay in the pros she can be able to stay in the pros as long as she wants because she has you know and i, I don't want to i don't want to put it out there that just women are ap empathetic but she had a look at things her empathy for our players her her relationship building with our players uh was just uh, she was so authentic with them and uh they really they loved her and and so it was really turned out to be a great move for both, but uh, that was the only thing. There was no really difference uh, then uh, that we had to be uh, aware of. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So another another question um, from the audience: uh, Did you use different leadership styles for dealing with um, younger, you know, young men uh, when you were coaching college basketball versus professional? Oh yeah, it, it's got to be very different because they're you have them somewhat, um, you know, they, they have school, they they have their study halls. You have a responsibility to make sure they're getting an education, and that you you can really um, not regulate their life, but you you can direct their life a little bit different. So this is the time practices. This is the time you you. You, you're not going to go in the front of classes. You're not going to go in front of study hall. You had to practice at a certain time. These are when your meals are set up. Where in the pros, it's all, they they have their money. 
and they, they know when practice is and that's it. And that's it. And you try to catch them whenever you can uh, to have in, to individual relationships with them. But it's really hard because they're grown up men. They have families and they, they do not. You don't have those, those situations where you can really meet with them uh, the way you'd like to. And uh, so it's it's hard. I think in, in, in what I learned, if I was back in that arena again, I would probably work even harder at it now. And I know that how hard it was to do. But it is uh, it is difficult to do. And in college, it is um, with the younger and then younger players in college opposed to older players in college. Our leadership with the younger players in college was basically really trying to teach them what they didn't have. They did not just know it. They had no idea they didn't know it. They really are coming in extremely naive to what it takes to be a good teammate. Good. They've been stars their whole life. And now you bring them in there and there's there's really a, a it's a time period. Very few freshmen are like a Hunter Dickinson or a Trey Burke. Very, very few or have that opportunity. Most need some time and you have to give them that time. You have to have patience, but you also can't, you know, let them slide on the on the important values you know, of integrity, of hard work, uh, those type of things. Thank you. Another audience question. Uh, do you think that um, our current political leaders could use some team bonding and leadership training? <laughs> oh, don't get me going here. Sorry. I, 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 <laughs> Fair, I'm gonna fair board school question for sure. Yeah, yeah I'm going to stay neutral, neutral here, but I have never, you know, I, I grew up in an era of of, of John F. Kennedy being elected uh, to be to be, be the president. My mother and father are both active in politics, and um, this past this past year has been amazing. And I, uh, but the the way that. I think that we used to have, and we got professors out there. I think we used to have about 60% in the middle and about 20% at each end. And it seems now we have 40% at each end and 20% in the middle. And so somehow, but just listening to each other. And here's one thing, just tell the truth, just tell the truth and have no political agenda other than do what's right and do, do the next right thing over and over again. And a lot of our issues be, don't worry about being reelected. Don't worry about anything except doing the next right thing. And uh, I think it would solve a lot of our problems right now. And be vulnerable and you'll bond. Because if you're vulnerable, then he or she on the other side of the aisle is going to be vulnerable. And it will go back and forth. And pretty soon you realize everybody's got flaws and we can work together. How's that? Is that good? That was good. That was great. I stayed. You're not, you're not going to get in trouble on that at I'm all. Not get in trouble, yeah. but I'd get in trouble what I say around my house. <laughs> all right. Bear with me, Mo, and I'm looking at some of the other questions. Um, so someone uh, just wrote, I'm the captain on my volleyball team. My teammates are complaining about a player who has great potential but won't bring her best but thinks she is the best. Uh, what should I say to her? <laughs> you are much, you are much more powerful than you think, but you are not going to do it by ramming it, you know, uh, by just, by just, just making her, you know, forcing it on her. I think building a relationship with her or he, if it was a, ma a male that um, she believes in you and she trusts you and, and with other teammates, that are willing to get her to pivot little by little. She's not going to change overnight. Little by little in this direction of being a team player, team first. And the better you, the more you give yourself, just give yourself to the team, just do it. Give yourself to the team and watch what a great game you have personally. And gradually they'll get there. But uh, most young players will come in like that and gradually they will learn and they probably, um, I'll, I'll give the four stages of learning. Are you ready? The four stages of learning. And as you try and teach or lead is that basically our freshmen were unconsciously incompetent. Most of them, that they didn't know what they didn't know. 
Next stage, sometime in their freshman year, they become uh, un- are they unconsciously incompetent. Oh, I see. There's a lot more to this. I got to eat right. I got to go to bed on time. I got. I, I need to share the ball. Then they become consciously competent. They really have to think about it, and they can do it, but they got to think about it. And then the great players, the great teams are, un- are, are unconsciously competent. They don't have to think about it. They coach each other. They coach other people. And that's that's where this young lady is right now. If she's a young, really good player, she probably doesn't know it all. And you can't expect her to. She She's never been in Big Ten, University of Michigan. You can't expect her to. So teach her gradually. I want that's going to be a quiz on those four <laughs> consciousness. I like that. All right. Last question. Okay. And we'll give you a chance to make any parting yeah. party yeah. shots that you yeah. want. Um, so what ad, what advice do you have for students today, and in particular for school students, but yeah. all, all students, I think, who share um, the, the goals of wanting to make a difference and wanting to improve institutions and communities in a very political and fractured world? What, it, what advice do you have to the leaders and best uh, who are currently students yep. at the University of Michigan. Well, this is another one from Dave Brandon, and I and I hope I have. I don't mean like, again. I don't mean to be dropping names. I just I don't want to take credit, but I'm I'm going to keep living these things because I surrounded myself with leaders so I could become a better leader. And uh, Le- Le- David's quote: "Leadership is not a position. Leadership is a lifestyle. Leadership is not a position. It's a lifestyle. And that's that's the." The, the the advice I give people when they're out there and they want to lead. Uh, there's another quote that, you know, integrity, integrity is a light. Send a signal. Send a signal wherever you go about integrity, where it's it could be as simple as, you know, when you had the meal, you know, the, in the restaurant, they undercharged you. And all of a sudden you're going back and saying, hey, listen, I owe you five more dollars. Or, you know, that you you know, you did your you you did not do your group well enough in that simple group that you 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 just didn't work hard enough and everybody out work you apologize to it. You know, these are little signals you can send out that I'm I'm trying to do everything the right way. And that will that just that just is a domino effect everywhere. And when you live this, you just can't turn leadership on and off. And with the price of that, you could do a hundred things well. John Beeline, right now, I could do 99 things to, to, to do well. I could be wrapping bandages for the Red Cross all day long. But if I go out and get a DUI, right, it all goes away, right? It is you are held to a higher standard if you really want to be a leader with that responsibility, right? There, there's, a, there's a lot of accountability to it. And it's so important that you just live that life and it's not easy. I This is... This is this is like my favorite quote. It's simple, but it's not easy. Just doing the next right thing to your conscious every day as a leader or as as one who wants to be a leader that not, is not maybe ready for that. Just doing the next right thing is simple, but it is not easy. For example, Paula, tonight when you go to bed, you're going to take that phone. It's simple. You can physically put it in the kitchen. I don't, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> it's simple, yeah. But it's not easy. And so that's that's when teams see that, when you see that, it's that day-to-day grind. I was I was on a leadership call with some Navy SEALs. This is this is uh there was five or six guys, this this guy, the Salad series, and there was two Navy SEALs, and they were talking about making it through Hell Week. And if anybody knows about that, you know, and these are approximate numbers again, but Let's say 100 guys come in on Sunday, whoever makes it to Friday, you know, maybe 10 will make it to Friday, become SEALs. The other 90 get washed out. And the one that made it said, the ones that don't make it, they don't make it to Friday, or they don't make it are the ones that are saying, all I got to do is make it to Friday. All I got to do is make it to Friday. They never make it to Friday because they're they're not living the day to day. The ones that say, all I got to do is make it to lunch. And now all I got to do is make it to dinner. And all I got to do is make it to bedtime. Those are the ones that make it. And 
That's why these little things of going through life, trying to do just the next right thing that comes in front of you. You don't know how many times I have a, a former player come up to me and just say, just try and do the next right thing, coach. Just trying to do the next right thing because they're out there. They're out there. So that's, so that's great. it. That's, that, that, I mean, that's, I, I'll go on for hour, for a while. <laughs> you know, I just, I'm looking at the time we are, we are at the hours. So uh, it's gone so fast. It's been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your time, but also your wisdom, your inspiration, your experience. Just can't thank you enough on behalf of the Ford School community. So please accept our warmest thanks. Um, best wishes to you and your family. And thank go you. blue. Go blue every day of our lives, every day. So thank you, everybody. Love the Ford School. As I said, my, my son Andy is a graduate. I love the Ford School and, and you, you you were all in a great place. And I'm envious of all of you because you're you're in the Ford School at one of the most interesting political times in the uh, history of the world and certainly the United States. So embrace every minute of it. Right. It's it's all all this adversity is going to provide incredible growth for all of you. And if things were easy, you don't grow. When things are tough, you get pruned, you grow. So good luck to everybody. And thanks for listening to me. And I hope I was helpful. You, without a, a doubt, you were. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Everyone be safe. Thank you.